Hey guys, have you ever wondered what goes on behind the scenes of a NASCAR race? Well, today is your chance because you're going to find out right now when we had a personally guided tour from Chevy of what goes behind the scenes before the Daytona 500. Coming up right now. We do this 38 weekends a year. There's uh, 36 points races and two exhibition races. It's like a big traveling circus. The other, it's not as sexy, but the interest, another very interesting part of this is the logistics of the series. If you think about, you know, they race coast to coast. There's two off weekends out of 40 weekends that they, they have to go home and you know, wash their trucks and whatever. Everything else they pretty much do on the road. Um, and it's just, a, it's kind of a logistical, whatever, nightmare or fantasy, depending <laughs> on your perspective, right? Um, so let's just, we'll walk over here and we'll talk about the optical scanning system. Hawkeye, you guys might have heard it referred to as? As Hawkeye? Hawkeye. Oh, I like it. Yeah, and Hawkeye, if you watch tennis, you know, and when they when they hit the ball and they decide whether the ball's in or out, right, they project an image of the ball on the court. Well, it's the same company that does this. That's called photogrammetry. Uh, inside the booth, there's a there's a there's uh, an array of projectors that project uh, patterns on the surface of the car. And then there's an array of cameras that look at those images and basically uh, create the surface of the car uh, to measure the location of that surface in space. Uh, what are they measuring? They're measuring. What they're trying to measure is the they they uh, locate on the frame rails of the car, and every car has. Come on this way. They're coming again. There's some holes in the frame rails of the car that they know the exact location of those relative to other reference points. And one of those things that they met, and so they measure the body relative to the frame of the car, relative to those bumps. And they can locate within 10 thousandths or so where the surface is, and they put, I want to say it's like 15,000 or 20,000 spots on the car that they measure in 90 seconds. And they can actually tell you where the surface of the car is. They can, re they can recreate the surface. So I think there's a standard that it has to meet, is that right? Right, so we provide, so what Chevrolet does, we design the car uh, and we get it to pass NASCAR's submission test. We give them our 3D CAD. They put our 3D CAD in the machine and they, and compare, they compare that body to our 3D CAD. And the reason that teams modify that is because they try to get an aerodynamic advantage to make the car perform better than it did when we submitted it to NASCAR. And there's about 150,000 tolerance that they're allowed from our CAD to what they get through inspection here. So what happens if it doesn't meet? Uh, if it doesn't meet this year, yeah. they get basically sent back around, and if they fail a second time, they lose a crew member. So for the race today, we've lost uh, three car chiefs. The three car, the 13 car, and the nine car all had to go through a third time before they passed. Uh, and that's, a, that's actually, I hate, uh, it's three Chevys I lost guys, but it's a good thing. Because if they're consistent with that, it's like having kids, right? You give them a set of rules, everybody's happy. Mom's happy, dad's happy, the kid's happy, because everyone knows what the rules are. And uh, that's what NASCAR is trying to instill in the teams this year, is really to, to, you know, they're doing what they said they're going to do. And the teams are doing what, they're learning that they're going to have to do what NASCAR says. Last year was a different story. Uh, this year it's, this year it's, uh, what's, what's so the body made out of? What's the, the body is made out of sheet metal from the, basically the roof and the sides are all sheet metal. Yeah. The hood's carbon fiber. Uh, the nose and tail are a carbon composite, uh, layup. And we produce, Chevrolet produces every part on the car. We basically design, source, uh, and have manufactured, warehouse, and distribute all the, all the body parts on the car. Right. So the car goes in, doesn't pass. Yep. Uh, what do they do to make a pass? How do you change the shape of the vehicle? Uh, beat on it with a hammer. Is it really? Yeah. Heat it up. Okay. Um, push on it with your hip. Whatever. I mean, it's whatever it takes. It's pretty thin. It's it's actually if you looked at the support structure, it's fairly. It looks kind of kind of delicate, and it's fairly easy to manipulate. So so I guess the question is, passes. What's to keep somebody then from hitting it more to make it more dynamic afterwards? Well, that's one of the tricks. And yeah. there's a post race inspection, and they determine after after the race they'll determine. If the modifications were intentional or just a yeah, it was a crash, just a you know effective racing and, and getting into somebody. So if you think about last year, they had you know you watch the last years in general. They you watch a Jackman, he, he 
put the car up on the jack and then he'd give it a hip check and cave the door in, which would get him you know, some additional aerodynamic forces that were <laughs> beneficial to how the car handled. So I, I guess when you're going 180 miles an hour, right? Yeah. Uh, horsepower doesn't come into play as much as aerodynamics because it takes it's exponential, right? You just need so much more horsepower to go faster. Whereas so square of square of speed is the horsepower required. So so if you really want to go faster, aerodynamics is a much easier way to accomplish it than adding horsepower. Yes. yes. It can be. Yeah. It can be. Yeah. And, and so what we got here though, we got 425 horsepower. So think about. How many 425 horsepower streetcars can go 200 miles right. an hour? Right. Not very many. So they worked, to your point, they worked very hard on, on reducing drag, reducing parasitic losses, not just drag, uh, friction in the engine, friction in the wheel bearings, uh, you know, not having to steer the car when you, when you turn the, you've got a tire that's not going straight down the road, that's a parasitic loss, that's drag. These tires and wheel assemblies, there's a tire and then there's an inner liner. So it's kind of a run flat system, if you will. And uh, they weigh about 90 pounds. And so when you watch a guy grab a tire, you know, the tire changers, right? It makes it look like it weighs about 20 pounds, as far as I can tell. They grab it, it's a five lug system, just like on your road cars. Uh, they've got tape on them that mark where, uh, where a wheel stud hole is or where a hole is in the wheel. And they sling it on there. and, and the way they do that, again, accurately and quickly, is they go recruit from uh, like Division I universities. They get wrestlers, they get track and field athletes, they get football players, guys that have high strength to weight ratios and, that, and, and are quick. Uh, and those guys that don't go into pro sports, this is a, become an avenue for some of them to come and make good money and, and be athletes uh, on pit road. So they inspect cars like three times during the weekend. They check them when they come off the trailer, mostly for safety. And then before they qualify, they do all this dimensional stuff. Uh, at this race in particular, they hand out spoilers so there's not, so the teams can't uh, mess with the spoilers very much, or at all, they're not supposed to. Um, they used to hand out springs and shocks for the rear, but they don't do that any longer. Uh, and you'll see them rolling through these various inspection stations, they do all this before they before they uh, go through the Hawkeye. The Hawkeye is kind of the last check before they get rolled out on the track. How many cars do you have at this, today's race? I believe there's 20 Chevys that are going to start today. And do, do you support all those teams? Do you uh, 20 teams or is it some? To, to varying degrees, yeah. Yes. Um, there's 40, 40 that'll start, there's 20 Chevys, I think there's a dozen Fords and eight Toyotas. What are, what are the weight tolerances? How, is there a, like a consistent range? Yeah, so there's a, I think it's 30, about 3,400 pounds basically, and that that's the weight with the driver. And so what they do is they weigh the drivers periodically, and they say, okay, your driver weighs 200 pounds, so your car's got to come through here at 3,200 pounds. So there used to be a there used to be a whole weight gain thing in the off season that the drivers would try to get heavy, and then it's like yeah. the opposite of horse racing. Right? Yeah, the you want, like, big, opposite. Big. <laughs> I'd be great at it. <laughs> yeah, me too. Well, I can put it on. I can't take it off. Um, so so when they come through here. They start off without spoilers, without um, without a restrictor plate. So in this area, they actually hand out restrictor plates. It's I think you know the size of the plate, Adam. Twenty nine thirty seconds. It's, it's just shy of an inch. So it's a it's a one eighth inch thick um, metal plate with four holes in it with very sharp square edges on it. And again, that's something NASCAR controls. They hand it out because a very slight modification of edges on the top or the bottom can result in a lot more airflow. So they hand them out here. Uh, they'll make them start the engine up on the other side and then they have a uh, sonic thing that listens for leaks all around the intake manifold around the base of the carburetor or base of the throttle body and um, make sure that there's no air getting in that from somewhere that it shouldn't be. Uh, our Chevy trucks are E85 compatible, right? The fuel that these guys run, it's a 15% ethanol blend, uh, so it's not quite 85%, but it is, uh, it is E15, so it starts out as um, 100, 103 octane Sunoco unleaded racing gas, and then they blend it with 15% ethanol. 
we were talking about tires before they mount up. I think 15 sets of tires for this weekend. So, and they're about 500 bucks a corner, five, so 2,000 bucks a set, let's say. And so if you think about what it costs to go racing, uh, it's just, it's 30, the tire bill's about 30 grand for a weekend. So what's, what's the typical budget of a NASCAR team for the year? Um, I would say, on average, probably in the 15 to 18 million dollar a year range. Um, Ain't cheap. No, and then, and then, you know, you get superstar driver, superstar crew chief, that adds to the bill. Um, what's the purse today? How much will... You know, they stopped publishing it. I honestly don't know. You don't know. I don't know. Yeah, they, if you look back, if you go to uh, racingreference.info, yeah. racing-reference.info, they publish all the all the winnings from past years, but they've stopped telling telling the public what it is. So, so how many cars will a team have? Yeah. Usually two? Uh, they're allowed to have as many as four. So Hendrick Motorsports with us has four. Yeah. Richard Childress Racing has two, and and two very closely tied satellite teams. So they effectively have four. Chip Ganassi Racing has two. Um, and then there's a lot of one-car teams, a lot of two-car teams, just depending on their, their budget. budgets and uh, sponsor situations. The, uh, the logistics part of the garage is pretty interesting. Like I said, it's um, there's been a lot of business opportunities for folks over the years. So the, uh, if you get out on pit road, you see the pit road, the, the, the pit boxes basically. The teams used to stuff those in their haulers. But then they started wanting to carry more things that made the cars go faster or could make the cars go faster. So some guy said, hey, I'm going to start a uh, transport company. I'm going to haul your pit boxes from race to race for you. Uh, they used to haul their own tires and wheels. And now there's a company that, uh, that basically takes wheels, dismounts the tires from them after, cleans the wheels. They'll repaint them for you, bring them back to the track. And they work with Goodyear to mount the tires here at the track. So the teams don't carry their tires anymore. That was another kind of logistical thing. Our, we have a golf cart that we use that drives around and we don't have room in our hauler for the golf cart, so there's another company. <laughs> you see all these golf carts driving around. They, there's another company that hauls golf carts. Let's hang it right here, sorry. So they haul two cars in the top of their haulers. And then beneath there are, you know, usually at least one spare engine, sometimes two. Uh, spare transmission, all the guts to rebuild a transmission and a rear end, several rear end housings because they're allowed to have camber on the rear. They're solid axles so you can't, it's not like a, like a multi-link rear suspension. you got to actually have a different housing to have different uh, camber. Uh, and then typically up in front there's an office where they try to promote togetherness between a, the crew chief, the car engineer, uh, the car chief, and the drivers. It's basically their office away from the office. There's, uh, there are roster limits now. They, they used to be unlimited how many guys a race team could bring to the racetrack. Uh, they are allowed, I believe, a dozen individuals that work on the car that don't include the pit crew. And it sounds like a lot, but it's really not. It's quite a few fewer than there used to be. So they've had to kind of rethink who goes to the racetrack and what their roles are once they're here. They, uh, there's a little hierarchy as well. They park, from, <laughs> they park in order of points. So I always joke about I want to go to the I want to go to the to the winners section, right? And that's that'll be the front of the garage where you know the guy that's in first place, his organization parks first, so they'll park off like right there you see three Penske haulers parked in a row. How about, how about the pits? Is it the same way in the pits? I mean, is there an advantage having the first pit versus there's the There's definitely an advantage yeah. to having the first and the last spot. Yeah. And then there are spots where there's, if you, if, again, if you get to walk pit road, you'll see uh, brakes in pit road. Yeah, that would give you an advantage Right, there's well. more space yeah. on the way into the one ahead of that and more space on the way out of the one behind it. Sure. I noticed the drivers all have helmets that are kind of plugged into the car. Yep. What, what is, is it a camera or what do they plug? They're plugged into uh, like an air conditioning system, okay. so they get cool air into the helmet. Yeah. Uh, some of them will have uh, visor cams, yeah, yeah. you know, where you get, get the, that point the cool, the, the, yeah. the first person perspective from the car. Um, they'll have, some of them have like a drink system that gets plumbed in that, that holds up, you know, that'll go through the front of the helmet. It's a long race, it's 500 miles. Yeah. I noticed yeah. even the Jack sponsored by FedEx. That's right, well, they're very, uh, you know, a company, especially like FedEx and like Exalta, 
that sponsors either all the races or the majority races. They they have a great deal of influence on the team's branding. Uh, so they the teams try to, you know, sometimes it's contractual and sometimes the teams are just trying to do right by their sponsors. H.Y. Patrick. Gotcha. Okay. What's your title, Patrick? Uh, manager of NASCAR competition for Chevrolet. Well, Patrick, thank you very much. That was really fun and really interesting to get right, yeah, kind of behind Patrick. the scenes of what's going on because, I mean, you look here and you see a lot going on.